this is this little guy right here. You want to pass him around? This is plastic eating fungi um, that has been discovered living off of only polyurethane. Uh, no other, thank you. No other nutrients. No other uh, nutritive substrate whatsoever. It doesn't even require air. And they require what? Air. So they can nice. survive in both aerobic and anaerobic environments. Wow. Oh, wow. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it's pretty handy. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. Um, it can, you can see there the, uh, the This was a done in dissecting microscope? Yeah, yeah, this was a, uh, a microscope at about 8x zoom. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, there's a, a compound microscope at about 8x magnification. Um, and you can see the actual hyphal network taking over the, the plastic. On the slide itself, uh, the red dye is from as it was metabolizing the uh, nutrient agar. It took on the red dye, and so the high phase actually you can see a little bit better than if it was just plain. And, and is the chat uh, it, that's on agar, right? Yeah, that's a uh, malt extract. The only nutrient that it doesn't seem to like is potato, and it's because it prefers uh, higher uh, nitrogen content. Hmm. So you can see the actual. Uh, fungal net, fungal hyphae, like intertwined with the polypropylene, to the point where even stretched out onto a slide, it will uh, it, it will retain you. Those those fibers will keep a hold. Uh, just, just, yeah. Needless to say, fascinating. Um, and we'll get a, a zoomed out view here in a second. I zoom out for a little bit. Um, and and the. Is no silly more faster when it's colonizing plastic versus agar? It's so, so it's kind of weird. Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> so it, it, it depends. Um, where is, one of those dishes ended up, uh, yeah, there, there's one in particular that started colonizing the walls of the, uh, of the container. Mm -hmm. And that one was very interesting. That was a little mutation. It was just the runt of the litter. It, it reached out, yeah, actually, I think it's that one that you're holding. Um, it reached out and it stopped growing after about a week and then it had about three to four weeks of no activity, no visible activity whatsoever. And all of a sudden exploded in growth only around the outside of the dish, <laughs> indicating that it found something tasty. The plastic, the plastic dish itself. <laughs> either that or it's trying to escape, which either yeah. possibility is absolutely <laughs> fascinating. Absolutely. Um, but you can see that it, it's taking on the, the plastic fibers, because uh, it's just poly. There we go, now we zoom out a little bit. And this is the actual structure we've been looking at, that whole thing, which is just a network of uh, fungal hyphae. The, the, the mycelium itself, you know, the organism, the fruit body is just the fruit body, obviously, as I'm sure everyone here knows. Okay. Actually, I was gonna start the slideshow. So now, how did we get here? There is an organization at the turn of the 20th century called the Phoebus Cartel. Uh, this was a, light, a collection of light bulb manufacturers. And they realized that because light bulbs were coming out and increasingly uh, longer lives, that they would go out of business if competition ensued. So they entered into an agreement. These were a collection of American and European manufacturers. And they decided to enter into an agreement where if your light bulb lasted longer than 1,000 hours, I think it was, uh, the, the group would find you. And you wouldn't be able to carry your products at any of their, their stores and their locations. Was, yeah, I hear some, some snickering. Yeah, that was. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Trust me, my thoughts too. Um, they were the first to introduce the idea of planned obsolescence. So the fact that we have all of this disposable throwaway stuff, the fact that there's a new iPhone every year and people just throw away the old one. Thank you, Phoebus Cartel. Oh. Yeah. It's like uh, our battery, car batteries last yeah. three years, right? Yeah. 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 They actually had, they actually had, in the 1910s, they had uh, light bulbs that last as long as our modern day light bulbs because technology had just advanced that rapidly. And then these fine folks decided that uh, it's coming on too fast and we have to stop it. 
And the struggle is still going on today as the right to repair. Uh, there's a whole lot of court cases that are coming out for consumers' right to repair components. Because like, for example, when um, an Apple just lost a case of this, um, for example, when, when your iPhone, like your screen goes out, well, the screen itself is $100 and it's a 10 minute fix. You can go to any kiosk in the mall and they can get you set up. But Apple says that you have to send it to them and it voids the warranty. Well, that only applies to Europe because in America, Canada, and Mexico, there's no such thing as avoiding a warranty if you just open it up to work on it. The warranty itself is the actual components. But because we have all this nice, uh, you know, you're not allowed to repair your own stuff, it's like saying that if you need to change the oil on your car or your headlight goes out, you have to take it to the dealer to get it replaced. And that's where we've gone. It's just absolutely absurd. But that's why we have this giant collection of trash. And if, you're, if it's something you're passionate about doing, I would highly recommend looking up right to repair. Um, so the negative impact of many toxic wastes from cigarette butts <coughs> to nuclear fallout, because there are radiotrophic fungi that can convert uh, gamma radiation into energy. Uh, all these things can be managed by, by the fungi. The high full network exudes digestive enzymes that decompose the most complex compounds on Earth. Fungi are nature's greatest chemists. Uh, we can see there are uh, the wine cap mushroom, seen here. Um, these will actually form a hyphae network that is so strong and so tight that it can filter out microbial contaminants from running water, like just a straight up water filter. You can run it through the network as a water filter. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, temporarily, of course, because you know, the, the network gets damaged as things come in because those hyphae are only one cell long, right? So they can get uh, physical trauma pretty easily. Um, but it's pretty cool that you can just have a living water filter right there. Um, and that one, yeah, because I trusted the computer to keep my formatting good. That was supposed to be a, a summary page. But, yeah, thanks, Open Office. <laughs> yes, sir. So uh, the reason why fungi are so, I'm sorry? We have yeah. a question. Uh, uh, yes, sir. A question about uh, uh, decontaminate uh, mercury and these other things. What happens to the metal? Does it turn into something else? Or I'm glad you asked. I'm getting to that. Question. Yeah, I'm getting to that. Um, okay. So the, the filter aspect, that's just um, microparticles, right? Like anything from a, an organism to a, a, a piece of litter or something like that. Um, basically, it's it's a way to make uh, wastewater like runoff. Like for example, like a pig farm where they just have all of the all of the waste go out and rushes into groundwater. Where you can set up a network of fungi and it'll filter out all of the uh, all the bad stuff that you don't want coming out of that waste. Uh, it'll remove that and just keep that from running into. Yes, sir. So does that damage uh, the filtration over time? Like, will it keep up with the excellent level? Over time, you'll need to do some maintenance just because it is a living organism and it didn't evolve to be a water filter. Um, it'll like it. It works like that, and you can you can do it. But you need to you'll need to go in and, and freshen it up with some more nutrients and things like that every once in a while. Do the toxins go into the fruit body? Again, I'm getting to that. No, uh, no I'm, I'm glad you're asking that. Though. Yeah. yeah. Um, sometimes, sometimes it will, sometimes it doesn't. It depends on toxin type. We'll get into that, though. Don't worry. <laughs> That's coming up pretty soon. Uh, the reason why fungi are so effective at filtering out all these pollutants is because they have a very, very high cell to surface area ratio, um, which basically means that the hyphae that grows out is only one or two cells wide, and then that allows that one or two cells, those, those few amounts of cells, they can absorb uh, through osmosis all of the uh, contaminants that surround it. And fungi are also really, really good at uh, withstanding toxins. They're better than any other multicellular organism at uh, living around toxins. Excuse me. And it's not the only way to go. Um, Microremediation is not the only form of remediation. There's also, uh, you do zoo remediation or phyto remediation, it's working with animals or plants. And with phyto, you have also phyco remediation, which is uh, algae, and you have dendritic remediation, which is trees. 
And this can get into what y'all were asking about the, uh, the other toxins, uh, especially heavy metals. Uh, with, with mycoremediation, the metals will, the carbon-based organic uh, pollutants and things like that will, uh, will break down in the digestive system of a fungus, usually. But for heavy metals, uh, lead, cadmium, mercury, things like that, um, and plants are actually much better than, than fungus because it can drawing a blank on the name. It's a phytovolatilization, where it basically aspirates the metals away into the atmosphere, and that gets it out of the uh, out of the, the system, basically the, the root system, soil system. Um, and as far as as far as metals go, the mold is actually quite a bit more handy than than fungus. Fungus is easier to work with because it's something that more people know how to grow than who know how to grow a mold. But if you look into how nature is doing this and how, how things are breaking down on their own, mold is something that you'll find at, uh, like for example, mines, uh, like abandoned iron mines and coal mines and things like that, because mold doesn't have a, a fruiting, it has a fruiting stage and they have fruiting bodies, but they don't grow these big, you know, handy mushrooms. And because it doesn't require all that energy invested in order to reproduce, it just kind of goes uh, it can spread in a, uh, a localized setting a lot more fast, a lot more faster, a lot more quickly in a localized setting. Uh, the great advantage with a fruit body is that it gets the, the spores up and into the air and it can go way, way long distances. And mushrooms are tremendous at that. Um, but it's like, think of it like uh, mushrooms in a rocket ship, uh, mold is like a horse. You know, if you want to get like way over there fast, you gotta take a rocket. But if you just got to go across town, like why build a rocket when you can just ride a horse? It, it seems like mold kind of prefers the area that doesn't have a lot of light, right? Like doesn't yeah, that's true too. A lot of light, like these caves, or even places that you might have a water leak <laughs> and it's leaked somewhere before. It, yeah. Even though it, it's not receiving any light, it's still kind of growing in its own accord in its environment. Yeah, that's true too. Uh, I thought mold was a fungus. It, it is a type of fungus, but when uh, for the for the sake of of the slideshow, um, okay. would, fungus would be more like a because uh, because there's and that's a whole other lecture because you have you have mold that are symbiotic bacteria and then mold that are straight fungus and then mold that relies on a, uh, a parasitic type of mold and there's certain mold like trichoderma for example is a uh, endosporic bacteria, so it's a bacteria that exhibits mold-like traits and it forms colonies, and it's, there's a whole thing. <laughs> Not desirable. But, yeah, fun, fungi, how we know them and how we're going to be talking about them would be different from a mold, simply because there's no, there's no fruit body state with a mold. Um, mold. Molds don't really require light to uh, trigger pinning. Um, as I'm sure all y'all are aware, if you've grown Mushrooms need light as just a trigger, just to let it know, kind of, hey, you've reached the surface, now you can fruit. And mold don't require that as much, so that's a good point. There are several different, oh good, the text stayed. <laughs> so as I was saying, you have phycoremediation, which is algae-based, not an ending trigger. Uh, you can also have phytoremediation that are based on a couple of different plant groups, so like different types of plants working together to remediate. And with mycoremediation, you can have, as we were saying before, you can have the plant growth promoting rhizobacteria, where it's just a, uh, a fungal bacteria, an endosporic, bacteria, uh, endosporic fungi, like trichoderma, um, and that will induce the growth of plants. Uh, you know, everybody hates trike, but gardeners love trike because that's the, the living, when you hear people talk about, if anybody's watched The Expanse and they talk about living soil, that's trichoderma is one of the main organisms in soil that helps plants um, grow. Um, so that's pretty cool, that's what they're talking about with that. And there, there are several other types of uh, endosporic bacteria that do that as well. Uh, once you get into the mycoremediation, you have a couple of different ways to, uh, to remediate with specifically fungi. Um, we're going to be, you can have symbiotic rhizospheric, which is similar to the plant growth promoting rhizobacteria, except you're, instead of the bacteria, it's a, a fungi, kind of like, uh, like morels or amanita muscaria, you know, 
our, our more uh, familiar symbiotic fungi. And we also have uh, endophytic, dark septae and other endophytic fungi, which are, those would be like, a little more like the molds, right? Like a black mold or something like that. Um, and other, other types of, without getting into a whole biology lecture, uh, other types of fungi that live within the, the root system of, uh, of a plant that wouldn't necessarily be symbiotic, wouldn't necessarily be parasitic, they just kind of rock together, you know? But what we're gonna be talking about today is saprophytic fungi. Now, saprophytic are, uh, uh, the kinds that break down dead matter. Uh, the big thing to understand is we have plant cellulose, which is sort of a monomer, where you have one single uh, atom that repeats, or I guess two, molecules that repeat over and over in these big long chains. And it's fairly easy to break down, well easy, it's more simple to break down than lignin. Lignin is the chemical that gives trees their rigidity. And as you can see over here, it's quite a bit more complex. Um, this is a polymer just means it, it's made up of many different uh, types of atoms. It's not a single repeating pattern because there are a couple of different structures of lignin. Uh, it varies a little bit, it follows up the same basic pattern, but you can have different variations uh, depending on the different trees. You know? uh, but fungi, the fungi that we're going to be looking at for uh, mycoremediation would be the kind, the, the white rot fungi that eats uh, lignin. Uh, and they're called white rot because the lignin is brown, and when it eats that, the refuse that's left over is, is white. Uh, brown rot eats cellulose, which is the clear sort of Outline of the outline. Yeah, it's a cell wall. It's a cellulose, um, and once that gets eaten, the lignin is left behind, and you have brown substrate left over. So, as far as organic pollution goes, who took organic chemistry? Who passed organic chemistry? <laughs> <laughs> Twice. So, organic just means carbon-based. Uh, carbon is a very, very handy atom as far as nature's little cookbook goes because it has, on its outer electron shell, there are eight spaces and only four of them are occupied. So it's, it can combine into all these different shapes. It can fold in on itself. It can do all this fun, different cool stuff and form all these different patterns. And so that's why life on Earth is carbon-based because it's just the easiest. Um, the next easiest is silicon, which is why if you're looking at life on other worlds, we look at carbon-based and silicon. I think silicon is five electrons, or is it three? I don't know, anyway, um, we're not talking about aliens yet. <laughs> Glass aliens. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, the fungi have been digesting those complex carbons uh, for over a billion years. There was the Carboniferous period, which is a period of, I think it was like 15 million years, where when a tree died, it just sat there, because there was no way for anything to break it down. Nothing had evolved to eat lignin yet. So there was just feet and feet of dead trees that were not decomposed in any way, shape, or form. It was just laying there. And then eventually fungus figured out how to eat them. They had a tremendous food source, and that's how we got to the amazing complexity of where we are today. They saw, they're very opportunistic, aren't they? They are, <laughs> yes. Uh, they'll just, they'll do whatever they can. Uh, and here, this is the one that I was talking about earlier. Um, that was, I think it ended up with you. So it grew to this, this white border right here, actually the, the red border, and this white popped up uh, fairly recently. Uh, you can see the, the plastic that was embedded. It kind of reached the edge of the plastic and it stopped. And there was no growth at all until all of a sudden all of this stuff came out. Uh, and so that was, that was really exciting to see, and I'm very, very excited to see if, uh, once, once this gets a little bit more covered, so I know it's not gonna get contaminated, too badly. Because like I was saying before, it can fight off contamination, but I still want to, I want to be able to transfer it, you know? And if I transfer something into with the contamination, it might not, uh, you know, contain my transfer, you know. But I'm very excited to see if this behavior transfers over as well, so stay tuned, we're gonna find that out. <laughs> there are many, many different types of plastic that it can consume. As we saw the, the lignin, that's a very complex chain, right? 
Well, what's really cool is this plastic that's been going around, or the plastic and fungi that's been going around the microspora has been seen eating polyurethane and living off of nothing else. Now, a little bit of a background. Um, the only reason why plastic sticks around for so long is because the carbon chains are just weird and long. Um, it's not something that nature is used to seeing uh, be eaten. And as, as I was saying before, when the, uh, the trees, uh, the Carboniferous period, there were no real organisms that could digest the trees, including bacteria. And that's what we rely on to break down pretty much anything that biodegrades. We want to make sure that it's able to be broken down by bacteria. Um, so with that in mind, we should take a look at all these different types of plastic and realize that if you can eat polyurethane, everything that's smaller will also be able to be eaten. And that's why those samples that are going around, they have embedded polypropylene and the the dish itself is made of, I believe it is, where is it? I just had it. What is giving it energy when it's feeding off of the plastic? Is it like the gasoline that they put in? Yeah, it's just the carbon. It's carbon. Yeah, it breaks down the, uh, it's like a fission reaction, well, fission. And, and do you have to prepare plastic in a certain manner prior to cultivation? When, when growing on agar, Yes, because agar has a lot of nutrients that everything else loves to eat. But the theory with this is nothing will eat plastic anyway. So once you have a, a good inoculated puck of this microspora, you just toss it in there and there you go. Because the only real difference there is that uh, it's not going to be able to have too much food. But you would still have to water it, keep it in a good It would still humidity. be too humidity. Humidity and a warm temperature. Um, it did not like, there's another one floating around with two samples, uh, two cuttings. And that one, uh, where did that one end up? They probably can't tell which cool. one's which. Well, it has, it, yeah, it has two, <laughs> two little bits instead of one little bit. Um, and that one, so yeah, that survived, that was after four weeks in the refrigerator. Um, yeah, go ahead, and, go ahead and pass it over here. Um, Yeah, go ahead and pass that one up. Um, because what was really cool about that is, thank you. So I'm gonna send this back around. You'll be able to see the, the outline, and it's actually, I outlined it on the, uh, on the back as well. Uh, the outline of when it went into the refrigerator and it stopped growing out and started growing up. It stopped its rhizomorphic growth and began a tomatose growth. And in doing so, it was, the tomatose was induced, and this weird pattern emerged. Now, this is a survival mechanism for it, uh, because it's not used to cold temperatures. Um, that was the longest sample that I kept in the fridge. So, really, if you're going to store this particular fungus, there's a lot of others that can survive in the cold. Okay. This particular one is it's native to Ecuador, and so you really shouldn't keep it in the fridge for longer than a month. <laughs> Uh, that's all of the other ones, uh, one week, two weeks, three weeks, they all came back to life within 24 to 48 hours and they were grown just fine. That one, it took it about a week to get back on its feet. So if you put it in the cold, that kind of inhibits the growth, right? So would you just yeah. have better luck just keeping it out in room temperature? Yeah. Um, it'll make sure that it's, uh, I mean, you can put it in, like take it in and out of the cold. Put it in the fridge for a couple of weeks, take it out for like a week to let it. Uh, yeah. Um, that could work. Does this one have a fruit body? It does, but it's kind of bitter, so it's not really. Yeah. That's the, the sample you gave me started to freak, so I threw yeah. it in the fridge. Really nice. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> I need to double check. I was in a rush that morning. Yeah, yeah, I'll yeah. send one poster. Yeah, yeah, we, we always like to see the progress reports on people's <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, for real. Um, I'm not really interested, like personally, I'm not really interested in getting into fruit um, just yet. I'm more interested in getting it to eat voraciously. But that's really cool that it is fruit. Like, that's, that's pretty neat. Yeah, that, that's really awesome. Yeah, go ahead. Um, if you keep it in the cold, does that uh, lengthen like the training time? Like the idea that other things won't survive in the cold, but it will because of the plastic? 
So it wouldn't be able to survive in temperatures cold enough to kill off contaminants and competition. Um, it, is, it is a warm weather fungus, it's a rainforest fungus. Um, so you wouldn't want to make it that cold. Um, but the, the cool thing is that after it's colonized the dish, nothing else can really get a toehold unless it's dried out to the point where it's weakened. Um, like I said, all these dishes, well, all the ones with, with cuttings taken out, like this, uh, I like as soon as I did this, like I dug my hand in, like my dirty finger in, and I, you know, <laughs> touched the size of it, and I went, oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, like I, I, I wanted, like even the fresh agar after I, uh, I cut it, I wanted it to get some kind of contamination in there. I wanted it to have to have to defend itself, and it absolutely did that. You can see that. Not only did nothing get a toehold, but it's so hungry that it started to colonize the, the bottom of the agar as well. That's crazy. So, um, so let's say we're growing on plastic, right? And yeah. you know when they have like spent blocks of mm -hmm. rain, uh, once the plastic has been fully colonized and flushed, all the you know yield would it have like a spent block kind of similar to the grain, like a big. You, that you have to figure out what to do next because it's like plastic. <laughs> no, that's, that's the other cool thing is that it metabolizes. The, okay, so if it if you if the plastic has a lot of filler in it, um, that might be an issue. Okay, because uh, there's a lot of plastics like like what we're getting into with PLA. Actually, you can go to the next one. This explains it a little bit well, a little bit better. Uh, so PLA has uh, polylactic acid. This is the plant, this is your plant-based plastic. All the plastic that you see that comes out, it says, oh, it's plant-based. Well, it's still, it's still plastic. It's still not gonna break down in the atmosphere. It's even more complex than like polypropylene or polyethylene, so it's gonna take even longer to break down than some of the artificial plastics. And could you argue that everything using oil is plant-based? Yeah, or dinosaur-based. Um, but yeah, now as far as as far as sustainability goes, it's a great idea, and I absolutely love it, and it works tremendous for three D printing, which is going to absolutely revolutionize the world. So you know, don't. Yes, sir. What's the largest um, colony known of this of this fungus? It's not really that well studied. Um, I wish I could answer that. It's it's not really well studied. As far as the the largest um, fungal mass, I think they did one that was. You know, I'm drawing a blank. I'm not even. I'm not. They're the record holders in Oregon. <laughs> yeah, that's the largest. But, that's not this particular but, one. But, but this this particular one, uh, it's not really uh, like mycorrhizal, like the no. other one is. So yeah. it kind of just pops up wherever it finds the organic matter to decompose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, uh, has the landfill been taken over by it or anything like that? That'd be good idea. Not yet. Yeah. So, don't be good for the helicopter. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's the idea, right? Uh, my, my goal is to be able to have something that's strong enough that you can just take a colonized puck and throw it in a concrete box filled with plastic. And boom, no more plastic coming out of your house. Mm -hmm. Yes? So what's going to happen, though, with like the medical app? Is it, it's like, you know, like this, like, oh, the unintended effects, it starts breaking down plastics that we, we still don't have really, like, the technology to live without. Yeah, I got you. Um, so you can see it. For, it it's not like an, an immediate, like, boom, it's melted. Like, it takes a couple of months at the fastest, a couple of years at the longest. Okay. So as far as medical application, uh, medical plastics goes, those usually get changed out, uh, if not disposable where we get back to our planned obsolescence, then within a couple of months to a couple of years, okay. it'll get swapped out. So it wouldn't out. happen so fast. Yeah, that it, it's not, exactly. Yeah, good. Getting back to the training, so mm -hmm. is the idea that you want to train it on the most complex chain, and then it will eat the small chains? So like if I raised it on uh, shrink wrap, then I wouldn't expect it to eat carpet. But if I raise it on carpet, I would expect it to just destroy shrink wrap. So it's, the great thing about that is that it's already trained on carpet. They found it, they just were, scientists were just walking through the Amazon, they found it growing on polyurethane. Oh. Um, yeah, it, with, without any other nutrients at all. They just discovered it and they brought it into the lab to, to look at it. So we already know that it'll do this, it figured this out on its own. So the only things that it would really need to be trained for would be uh, polyethylene and 
the board for a medical application. So it's mm -hmm. much, 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 much more complex than just this. So I would doubt that it could eat this. It might be able to, but I would doubt that it would be able to eat that just as is. Um, so it's safe to say that humans have a particular effect on evolution of this fungus. Yeah. yeah. If we can turn wolves into chihuahuas, we can we, like, we this. You know? uh, so those that I've been training it in are polypropylene, which is uh, using a lot of furniture, auto bodies. It's also using unicorn bags, unicorn mushroom growing up. Oh, sorry. I knew the marketing, I haven't plugged it. Um, Unicorn's been doing uh, biodegradable bags since 2002. This is also a really good way to break down the conventional bags because obviously uh, a biodegradable mushroom bag you can't sort in your garage. And so if you get a case of a thousand of them, you got like 90 days to go through a thousand bags. It's just like, okay, like I believe in you, you can do it, but it's a lot of work. <laughs> yes, good. Oh, what do you oh, mean? Oh, sorry. Um, like grocery sacks? I don't know what they're yeah. made of. Uh, so grocery sacks are, I think those are. Uh, plastic type zero, because um, I know a lot of recycling plants won't take those, but they will take straight polypropylene because that's what unicorn bags are made of, and that's uh, plastic type five. Um, I believe grocery bags are either low density or high density polypropylene, um, and that that just means that they're they're tougher with less material being used, and that's why they gunk up the the sorter machines and all that, is because it's it's such a a lightweight material that uh, doesn't want to break down. And will it eat all types of polystyrene? We don't. I think so. I would assume <laughs> so. There's not a whole lot of research coming out about that. Um, but I, I believe it would, uh, just based on the fact that it would eat polyurethane, which is a much more complex and long carbon chain. Okay. And the other thing to keep in mind is when you think carbon chain, don't think of it like, like chain. It, it's more like chain mail where it's this vast network of, it's really three-dimensional chain mail because it's all of these things, you can think of millions and millions of these particles all interwoven and all intertwined together. And at each of these points is connected to multiple other parts of the, of the network. And that's, that's really what makes it uh, quite a bit more difficult to break down. Uh, there's a company called Willow Ridge out of Kentucky. They make a oxobiodegradable additive that can be put on to apply to any plastic. And what that basically does is it bonds to the molecular structure of the, of the substance itself. And then it uh, catalyzes with oxygen in the environment to break it up down so that the atomic mass is lower than the Dalton number of water, at which point bacteria can absorb it. And we were talking earlier about bioremediation being bacteria-based uh, in most applications. Um, and that's just because at that point, once this gets broken down to the point where it's light enough that bacteria will consume it as it's just, you know, crawling around looking for water, it'll take something that's lighter than water. And at that point, it becomes the foundation for a food chain. So you have an ecosystem at this point with plastic as the substrate and bacteria as the basis for that. And then everything that eats bacteria comes in, critters come in and eat bacteria, other critters eat those critters, circle of life, that whole thing. So I was going to ask you about yes. the marine applications. Mm -hmm. So you're saying this uh, fungus can survive marine conditions it and can. go in and destroy all the pl plastic that's roaming in the ocean? Yes, it can survive in both fresh and salt water. It wow. grows more slowly, but it will survive in that. So there's applications there as well. Uh -huh. There are other fungus that are a little bit more suited to marine life. Mm -hmm. um, if I lived on the coast, I'd be playing with those as well. Mm -hmm. But I don't feel like uh, mixing like 3%, I think it's 3.5% salt. Yeah. And like figure like <laughs> that's just a whole like and I think bacteria are faster anyway right so yes we still have to look for a bacteria that will do all this yeah bacteria this double faster. inside in population every 20 minutes yeah. uh, which is why yeah there's which no is why if you've ever taken a food handlers class uh, they tell you that temperature safety zone right that temperature danger zone of 40 to 140 uh, it's every 20 minutes a bacteria will double and then they'll They'll die off as well, but they double, uh, they increase at a much faster rate. So that's where, really, if you think about it, uh, Fibonacci sequence kind of comes into play there. Um, so think of it like in, uh, after 12 generations, it's not there's 12 times as many bacteria. It's exponential. After 12 generations, there's 12,000 times as many bacteria. So that's why food poisoning is a thing. <laughs> yeah. 
But getting back to the utility of, of this fungus, this is only one of over 200 plastic beetle fungi. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's insane. And oysters are one too. Uh, oysters are just absolutely voracious eaters. Uh, and they're quite tasty. They taste much better than this does. <laughs> um, but yeah. again, over 200 different kinds. I just want to get something that can withstand um, contamination, fight it off, and eat quickly. I think people just always have a problem with eating something that grows on plastic. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What does it taste like? It's plastic. very bitter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Um, it's, it's bitter. It's got kind of a not really a metallic taste. Um, it's, just, it's not. It's just not very pleasant. It's not toxic. It's not poisonous. That's a problem here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's no microplastics left. You know the little Correct. pieces. Oh. Yeah. Um, it's so because the plastics are just carbon. Um, it just dissolves the carbon mm -hmm. and the plastics along with it. So you can safely eat it. Yeah. It just tastes bad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But it would be good for like it would be safe for animals though. Mm -hmm. For example. Um, yeah, like seasoning. Yeah. yeah. So like if uh, like if you have cows or something. And, oh, sorry. Yeah. That's good. No, no. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say, if you have like cows or something, and uh, you know, there's, you know, they get into your plastic patch or something. Well, cows aren't going to eat it. Goats would eat it. Yeah. Uh, but it, but the, if they got into those mushrooms, then it wouldn't really be that big of a deal. So uh, if you were to try and um, like experiment with it, would it be best to put it in a setting like a My idea, my version 0.5 for this would be like a concrete box, like maybe something made out of cinder block, okay. um, which would almost have to be outside because of the, the weight and the you know, difficulty and all that. Um, in order to get past the, uh, the, the temperature when it drops in the winter, that would be either re inoculating in the spring or more. Uh, a little bit more forward thinking, a little bit more work, but would be to uh, throw like a thermal blanket on top, or like throw a heating element of some kind in there just to let it do its thing. Again, disposable society, uh, get a little $20 like uh, plant uh, incubation pod and let it eat that. Actually, no, don't do that. I just realized that's probably gonna start a fire. Don't let it do that. <laughs> get that on the outside and then wash it with bleach after you're done. Uh, but no, it's, as, as we were saying before, it's not like it's you're just gonna wake up and everything's gonna be melted. You're gonna you're gonna see it growing. Like, you know, this is a month old and it still hasn't gotten out of one of the uh, easier plastics to break down. This is polymethylmethacrylate, methacrylate, um, methacalor. Sorry, um, no, this is actually polystyrene, um, not acrylic. I don't know where my head was. Um, those are polystyrene, so with those being even easier to break down than, than the other thing that I almost told you that it was. Some of these uh, materials, like the density is a lot more, uh, I guess, for um, lack of a better term, hard. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, when you're trying to grow mushrooms, like uh, maximizing the surface area to get the mycelium to slip through those cracks, right? Is what you're trying to aim for. So, would you prefer to shred those tougher uh, plastic materials that you know kind of compact it together so it makes it a little bit more easier for the mushroom to kind of grow? Yeah. So that's a good question. Um, when you shred plastic, it doesn't actually shred the chemical. The the molecules don't get shredded, so it still have you know you still have excuse me, because molecules are so tiny, you still have you know, millions and millions of molecules on something the size of this little clip. Um, and so when you shred it, it doesn't really increase digestion. It will increase rate of colonization, though, because the mushroom has, you increase the surface area of the plastic, so the mushrooms can get to that more quickly. So the initial colonization phase um, will be much faster. So if there were additives in the plastic, or if there are nutrients. Um, that's why, for example, they, you know, you cut up uh, you know, other pieces of substrate, like uh, like chopped up straw instead of regular straw, uh, chopped up uh, like, like wood dust, and, uh, wood uh, sawdust instead of wood chips. 
just because it increases the surface area, uh, it, but it doesn't actually aid in digestion. Okay. Good question, though. It's, it's an important uh, distinction. A, a, a distinction as subtle as peeing in the pool versus peeing into the pool. Okay. So where do the straws? <laughs> where do straws fit in? You know, like straws that end up. There are a couple of different uh, materials that can be drinking straws. That's why it's not really listed because there's like three or four mm -hmm. that it could be. Um, there are usually some type of polypropylene, um, but but not always, and that it's uh, it's been changing recently as well. Okay. We have a landfill. Landfills usually are composed of mostly different plastics. Yeah. Would you just airdrop a single one, or would just be introduce multiple different uh, like fungi within a single landfill? To inoculate a landfill? Yes. Well, those are landfills are usually several acres in size, so definitely you would want multiple inoculation points. And like, would it? Are you familiar with the construction of a landfill, like the layers and stuff? So I know, yeah, I know that. Um, I'm not super familiar. Um, I have a cursory understanding, though, just in, in so far as it relates to this. I know that uh, the old style, feel free to jump in if I'm getting this wrong. I know that originally, up until like the mid 2000s, every landfill was built with the intention that nothing would ever degrade, ever. It was supposed to be a completely anaerobic environment where trash would just sit and nothing would ever decompose. Yep. Which I have no idea who thought that would be a good idea. <laughs> like, I don't know what they were on. Like, to think, oh, just don't do it. Like, you, to the point where there was a doctor from uh, Berkeley who dug out like apples and sandwiches from decades ago, and they were fit for human consumption, according to the FDA, like according to FDA guidelines. It just absolutely disgusting. Um, or not, because it was fit for consumption. I don't know. Um, but and then the modern uh, modern landfills that were built after the mid two thousands uh, do have uh, bioremediation intention where there are it's not completely anaerobic and if it is they have anaerobic bacteria that are producing enzymes and they'll digest um, and that's when you'll see like for example um, like tarps like big long tarps over it because that's actually going to collect methane and then they use that for a biofuel as well so i was asking that because it's in like the modern samples there's mm -hmm. and leachate leachate is just like it garbage juice basically all yeah. the whole rain goes through because some most of them are formerly anaerobic all the water pools at the bottom because imagine a giant bathtub that's filled yeah so at the very bottom there's leachate and so it's leachate's the dangerous thing because it can seep into the water table yeah so is there like a, you could you possibly use it to remediate the leachate absolutely or is that because it's a liquid would the fungi just avoid it no it's it would grow with that um They'll, they'll grow in, in fresh and salt water, and they would also grow in, in leaching. It would, it, they would just look at it as a, uh, as a, as a liquid growing thing. Um, it wouldn't spread as quickly as it would in solid, mm -hmm. and because it is more toxic, it would prefer its other food sources first. But it would, it would colonize that, it would remediate that, and it, more importantly though, it would stop those toxins from entering the leaching in the first place. So that way, when the liquid Builds up, it would be much more benign. Uh, it would still have liquid buildup. It would still have a whole lot of secondary and tertiary metabolites, but it wouldn't be as volatile to uh, organic life. And if, it, and if the um, landfill, if they measure um, what is coming in and then what is coming out, if there are in fact yeah. toxins, Grand Prairie um, does it. They measure what goes in at the beginning and then it goes through and whatever comes. I didn't know that Grand Prairie was doing that. That's brilliant. Yeah. It's very I took oh, it's in the composting master class. Oh, it's good. I think most big cities do weigh the trucks coming in because they want to get an idea of how much magic tonnage is being yeah. dumped on their land. Yeah. And it takes, um, <laughs> and we also need help with um, composting your kitchen scraps. It takes mm -hmm. uh, 25 years for a head of lettuce to break down in an wow. anaerobic wow. environment. And wow. so if you have worm bin or something to compost your bokashi bin, to compost cool. your kitchen scraps, it would yeah. help the environment. Yeah, yeah. and that gets into uh, what we were talking about before with <coughs> micro remediation isn't the only way. Zoo remediation with a worm bin or mm -hmm. you know, bugs or 
or whatever life form, you know, animals doing that. Uh, vegetable scraps just being thrown out of the yard, like people in, uh, in the hill country do this, they'll throw vegetable mm -hmm. scraps in the yard for deer. And now there's a, an abundance of deer in the city because they know that they're coming to people for food. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's a whole, that's, that's, another, that's another talk. Yeah. Um, but yes, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up um, because a lot of, there's a lot of misconceptions about uh, biodegradable mm -hmm. and uh, how things, how fast things will truly break down. Um, and it's very important to keep in mind that in nature, it, it also takes a minute sometimes. Um, so it can be accelerated by adding non-nutritive substrate. I would recommend non-nutritive substrate for uh, remediation. The idea is that the more nutrients that are available, the less likely the fungus will be to uh, eat the plastic. So really you're just wanting it to, to bulk up kind of and kind of take over the, the environment so it has access to all these other nutrients. Because as we established, once it realizes that there are other nutrients in the mix, it will develop a taste for it. It'll start exploring this possibility. It'll realize, hey, there's this whole untapped resource right here that nobody else is trying to eat. I'm gonna eat it. Because that's, that's the game of life, right? Is, is you find your niche and you exploit it. Um, but the basic rule of thumb is the more plant matter that's used, it's going to slow the, the eating of the plastic, but the less plant matter is used, it's going to slow the initial growth. It's all about finding that, that happy balance. So back to combining this with training, mm -hmm. would I want to feed it a lot of plant matter just to get it big and then wrap it in a bunch of shrink wrap so it's forced to um, another kind of uh, You can do that. Okay. You, you can absolutely do that. Um, I, would, I would recommend mixing in some plastic with the initial uh, carbon source. Sort of like what I did with the, with the agar plates where I just had some cut up polypropylene and sprinkled it in. Um, but you, you could absolutely do that and just have it grow and then change shape once it realizes that there's no more plant matter left. Um, like I said, the, the, the science is still in its infancy on this and there's not really an accepted technique mm -hmm. for growing this. Mm -hmm. um, so we're just, we're throwing spaghetti at the wall right now, you know? So Greg, can you, just, yeah. can, you can you go back to that slide and just Oh, with all the, with all the names? I, no, no, not that one, the, the one you were just on. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so I, I'm, maybe it's just me, but I'm sensing a, a disconnect or a, or a contradiction. You said remediation can be accelerated by adding carbon, but then the more plant, go to more plant matter you use, slower plastic you eat. So mm -hmm. um, I thought that the idea was to accelerate it and make it, make it into a big colony. So right. Can you break that down for me? Yeah. So it wants to eat what it evolved to eat. Um, right. It's naturally going to want to eat plants instead of plastic. So when you give it those plants, it it will grow faster, and you'll get that that exploding growth that that we're looking for, that big healthy organism. But then if it's only eating that plant, it's it's like taking it's like going to a buffet and having only right. one type of food. You know. Um, so, so the, yeah, the example that I use is it's like going to CC's and you know, the, the plant matter is the pizza. Like, why am I going to touch a salad? I got to fill up on pizza, right? <laughs> but if we're out of pizza, well, I already paid three ninety nine. I might as well eat some salad, right? So, that's good question. Great, though. That's a great analogy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Was there anything else? No, no one eats salad. Pizza yeah. <laughs> I, I, well, you know what? I mean, if I'm going to eat 15 slices of pizza, I should probably get some lettuce in me first. Get some fiber. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. Uh, so I'm still I'm trying to get some, uh, yeah, into this training thing. Yeah. So, like, would it be better to force it to eat plastic when it's a very small colony, and then feed it a bunch of non-plastic so it explodes, and then oh, trap it in the plastic again? Or is this, you know, one of those things that we just haven't explored yet? That's what I'm trying to find out. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it is one of these things that we haven't explored yet. Um, it will definitely work both ways, uh, but I'm not sure That'd which way to do be like side by side yeah. in a controlled yeah. environment mm -hmm. to kind of figure out yeah. what's the best scenario. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you're just saying there's a trade-off between how fast it grows with less plants and how much it's going to feed on plastic. Exactly. We've got to figure out yeah. where the sweet spot is. Yeah, exactly. 
you're saying that this is a relatively new field, why is it that like everyone's like, we do bio remediation, we do bio remediation? Is it just like a hoax then? <laughs> oh, no, no, it's because. because yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, unfortunately, people try to take advantage of yeah. like a situation, situation and yeah. right. try to cash in on like, like the opportunity they can. But yeah. there, there is there, there is a legitimate, you know, uh, uh, result when they actually do these things, right? Uh, some of them, at least, you know, because worms they do break down material, mushrooms break down material, so it does make sense. But a lot of these are a by a case by case basis, you know, like you're really dealing with certain environments, and then you trying to figure out what's the best scenario to get rid of that pollutant in that environment, right? And each one varies, so your rate of success could vary on the situation that you're presented with, right? <laughs> so, yeah. are you saying that like within the field of like microremediation, you can count all the researchers like on your hand or something? No, there's been a lot of research um, with different types of fungi, but because it's not, so there, there's a couple of different, different reasons why it hasn't been uh, exploded. The, the most obvious is that there's not a, well, the, the easiest to say, the, 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 the most fun answer to give is that there's no money in it, which there really is, but it takes away money from, for example, recycling programs, which are primarily, recycling centers are primarily owned and operated by fossil fuel companies. Uh, recycling is just oil subsidies with extra steps. It usually, in most cases, not all, in most cases, uh, producing a recycled good costs more energy than producing it from raw. Um, and it's, recycling is a great way to shift blame from the dozen or so mega corporations that produce 50% of the world's pollution to you, the consumer. Why aren't you recycling? Why aren't you composting? What, what's, why aren't you doing your part? Yeah, exactly. EP is part of the Exactly. And it's, you know, me taking the bus instead of driving my car to work isn't going to, you know, offset the carbon that, you know, Leo DiCaprio uses when he takes the you know, private jet, or when Bono books a flight for his hat because he forgot his hat. This is a true story. <laughs> this is a true story. Bono <laughs> forgot his hat yeah. and he went on tour. So instead of just going to the store and buying a new one, he bought a first class plane ticket for his hat. Oh, no. right. I could and have brought him his hat. Yeah. He bought me the ticket. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so he had, like, for real, there was a first class, like, two seats, you know, one for his assistant who brought the hat, and then he puts the hat on his seat. Like, this is true, this, this happened. And this isn't like, you know, when U2 was first started, this is like 2012, 2011, this happened. Like, yeah. Dude, could the assistant not just wear the hat? <laughs> or a family member come out. <laughs> just, go to, like, just go to the store and buy a new hat. Yeah. Bottom, you can afford it. It's not like it's like yeah. lucky underwear, or lucky socks, or something. If you're a, a batter, you know, you're Bono. Who cares if you bomb a show? You bomb every show. You're Bono. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm yeah, I'll be carbon neutral like Al Gore. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so if, if like, so I work at a, at a campus. If I had a sarlacc pit of this stuff, could I just like throw plastic bottles in there? Yes, and I love that you use. I'm I'm gonna steal yeah. that by the way. Mm -hmm. Like it's good. Like I'm gonna make some memes out of uh, okay. a sarlacc pit. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, that, that's a really good. But I would need like a like a huge like a tennis court size uh, amount to eat it regularly. For for like a campus size, yeah. Um, I'm, you'll need a super soaker filled with liquid culture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Spraying it. And yeah, you, you could do that too. Just have like a pit. And then just sit there with a water hose, like in the mornings, yeah. right before. <laughs> Watering your plastic yeah. bags. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just like water yeah. up at the roof and then you know, close it. Don't so worry, nobody something. thinks yeah. you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so like scalability is probably not there for like a rapid. It's, uh, an empty yeah. Empty yeah. Empty yeah, the research isn't there yet to have an end product, like the thing. If you buy the thing and you're done. Uh, we're not quite there yet. That's not to say that there won't be like a new size box of mycelium for sale in the future. You can just throw in like a, like a four yeah, yard long container long of plastic. Long. Yeah. How do you an empty swimming pool would work. Yeah. 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 Swimming pool and everyone who doesn't get to get into the yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it, it's like fifteen hundred dollars to rent a uh, excavator for a week. Mm -hmm. So I can dig a lot of holes in an excavator in a week. The same. Um, but yeah, so so 
to getting back to why this hasn't really exploded in popularity. Um, the other reason is that it, the, the, I don't know if this is widespread, but if it's not, I'm gonna make it widespread. The Superman <laughs> syndrome, which is what we saw with marijuana legalization in California, where everybody pushes for it, everybody's really excited, and then it happens, and everybody kicks back and says, okay, mission accomplished, I don't have to do anything. So everything ever when there's everything a problem. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but specifically, the reason why I draw the comparison with uh, California's marijuana industry is because once all the activists and all the legacy growers backed off, the only voices that were in the room were ones belonging to pharmaceutical interests, Monsanto, Big Agro. And so now you have all of these growers that have been muscled out of competition, and they've been completely taken over, and nobody knows why. How could this happen? Who could have seen this? Well, you left the table before the conversation was over. Like, this, there was only one way this was gonna end up. And that's kind of the same situation here, where there's a lot of brilliant grad students who do some amazing work for their, their thesis, for their PhD, and then they leave and they go work in a chemical factory at you know, Dow Industrial or B&E yeah. &E or whatever, and nobody ever touches it again. They have their research out there, you can look at it, you can do it if you want, but nobody, there's no billionaires who are gonna pay them you know, 50 to 80K a year to continue working on it. And none of these scientists are grouping together to start their own like, company or anything. Right? Yeah, okay. yeah, no, because that's... Um, the scientists don't wanna run a company. <laughs> yeah, no, they, they won't play the lab, yeah. <laughs> We'll talk to Elon Musk. Maybe he'll take it up. Yeah. yeah. Oh, don't get me started on electric cars. No. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it I'll takes, get started too. It, takes, it, takes, it used to be 10. It's now gone down to 8 because uh, internal combustion has gotten so much more efficient. Uh, eight years worth of emissions of an internal combustion car in order to offset one Tesla worth of electric car batteries. And that's still, that's lithium. Lithium is mined in third world countries by people who don't wear respiration equipment. Um, they're working for slave, wage, for slave wages. They die in their 30s and 40s. Um, it, it just like, that's a whole other thing. Yeah, it's a stable thing. Yeah, electric cars are, I mean, granted, he made the electric car sexy. And that is, in pop, like, that was, nobody thought that he could do that. That's amazing. Um, he's cheapest ride into outer space so we can use satellites and we have all kinds of stuff going on so you know Elon's not a full-on shell he's not the bad guy but he's not this uh, he's not an environmental yeah. saint he's it's a business model he's he's he is a net positive for the world I believe that but it's not like uh, so pretty much we're screwed if we do or don't yeah. <laughs> just don't let him be the only voice in the room yeah 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 it's our electric we're, we're still going yeah. around the environment yeah, well, you use mushrooms to offset your. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's another thing with the emissions. Okay, so you can, and you can look this up. There's a there's a teenager in uh, Plano. This is 2012, 2013, 2011. They're in. Uh, a teenager in Plano invented a not invented bred a type of algae where you have like a tank of algae. You stick it at the end of an exhaust pipe, and it completely eliminates 100 percent of all emissions from every single type of uh, gasoline and diesel. 100% elimination of all emissions. That patent was purchased by Toyota in 2012-ish, and we haven't seen any they progress. Sat on it. That's been no the cartel, probably. Yep. Yeah, they sit on all yeah, the Yeah, because if you they have a thing of algae, it. why are you gonna buy a catalytic converter? Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's problems, problems. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not as bad, but it's also a lot worse. Right? Mm -hmm. But that's also in this age of uh, you know, internet and where everybody is interconnected, you can spread this information a lot more quickly. And you can ask these questions like, why hasn't anybody else put out an algae tank? It's because there hasn't been any more publicity about it. You know, that's the first time I haven't heard about it. So. <laughs> I know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. Uh, he's in high school, maybe that. And their, their promise was that they were going to make the thing, right? The box that you stick on and everybody is gonna have the box. And that's a great business model too, because if you have the box, if you sell it, sell us. guess what? You, you sold a box, you made money. And people can buy a car without guilt. So and there's no place to buy get, the box? You don't get no. the sexual satisfaction of ruining the planet. <laughs> yeah, 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 like we can still, like we can like, literally have your cake and eat it too. You have a box, it eliminates all pollution and we can make synthetic gasoline. The U.S. Navy 
uh, made synthetic diesel at like four dollars a gallon, just like making it out of salt water. Um, so it produces the cost to produce it is the equivalent of four dollars a gallon. Um, so we don't use it because we, until recently, uh, gas prices were low enough that it didn't really make a whole lot of sense. Now we're going to have to do a whole lot of uh, rethinking on a lot of this stuff. But uh, short story long, we can we can convert everything right now if we were if we were serious about this and if this technology was being researched and uh, we weren't uh, the Phoebus cartel weren't alive well today. We would be able to drive just regular unleaded gasoline, 87 octane cars with no emissions coming out whatsoever. Um, but that's a whole, again, that's a different, that's a different uh, uh, lecture. <laughs> so the uh, <clears throat> with with plants with organic waste. Uh, the fruit bodies are usually unaffected because the carbon itself, unless you have other binding agents, like China was caught using uh, lead and cadmium in about 18% of the toys that they were exporting to Nigeria. Um, yeah, this was a study that came out in 2000, and again, I think it was 2012, 2015, something like that. Um, so they might have changed how they're doing things, I'm not sure, but the fact remains that it was, it's established that it does happen. So in those instances, it's a little bit different. But as long as it's pure plastic, uh, like for example, a unicorn bag, no. uh, if it's pure plastic, the carbon is just simply digested and transported by the uh, intracellular uh, digestion. So the, the, the molecules, because aside from carbon, there's also hydrogen and oxygen. Nitrogen are usually the binding agents, and then there's also phosphorus, potassium, and a few other elements that are usually used to make these uh, polymer chains. And the fruit bodies can as long as there's no other adulterants in there, the mushrooms can take care of that completely and it's 100% safe to eat. Um, getting back to, to metals, um, most fungi are hyperaccumulators. So as they take in the intracellular digestive process, these metals, uh, mercury for example, will concentrate in the fruit bodies themselves. Now, this is bad for anybody who wants to eat them, but very, very good for people who want to clean up the soil, because now you have removed these metals from the soil and put them in a mushroom that you can now pick and dispose of however you see fit. So that's really cool. And we're also going to get into electronic waste, because that's another thing that's really cool, um, is metals play into that as well. Um, the ions turn into nanoparticles, so instead of microparticles, nanoparticles, and that's what gets transported through the, the fungus itself, through the, the hyphal network. <clears throat> and other xenobiotics as well, uh, which is a really cool word that I'm totally uh, trying to coin. Xenobiotic, just anything that doesn't belong to uh, the organism. What did you say xenobiotic was again? Xenobiotic, just something that uh, is outside of the organism, or something that's different from the organism itself. Meaning, the, meaning yeah, in anything that it could be living, it could be dead, it could be just just any number of uh, contaminant, or just just this. Uh, it's a big nebulous term that basically just means foreign uh, body or foreign um, particle. Uh, has there been any experimentation with radioactive waste? Yes, uh, I don't know about specific, well yes, actually there has been experimentation with that. Um, there was a group in, I wanna, I wanna say it was UCLA. Uh, they made a, so they they took a, I'm trying to remember the name of the fungus that they did this to. Um, they had it myceliate a bunch of straw, and then they encased that straw in concrete and used that to contain uh, nuclear waste. Um, and it, it was quite effective. So, uh, I think there's something in Chernobyl. Yes. In terms of fungus yeah. mm -hmm. not um, having problems. Fungus has has uh, fungus around Chernobyl has just spontaneously developed the ability to absorb radiation and use it as a form of energy. Mm -hmm. um, now it's it's very like it's still it just <laughs> happened, uh, you know, because Chernobyl just happened, like geologically speaking, right? Um, so it, it's still a very sickly fungus and you wouldn't want to, to use that as a form of energy generation. Yet, 
But again, remember what we were talking about with as generations keep going on, each one gets better and better and better. So within a few decades, um, ICF being a, a very uh, viable way of protecting against radiation. And NASA is using uh, fungi. There is the uh, myco architecture project to use uh, mushrooms to grow space habitats because one of the big dangers of space exploration is cosmic radiation and you need approximately 50 to 60 percent as much uh, fungus to block out radiation as you would a uh, regolith or steel. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that's really cool. You can have walls that are, and, and it also self heals, so any micrometeor or anything like that that comes through, uh, you'll be able to repair much more easily. They're also trying to use a way, I think I heard a podcast a while back that talked about the way that it's able to grow within the nuclear waste um, mm -hmm. is because it's highly melanated. Yeah. They're trying to find ways to melanate cells within um, like cancer patients so that when they're going through chemotherapy, they don't get so sick. And then also yeah. the protection uh, for astronauts. Yeah, um, so yeah, you're right. Because that's uh, the, the mechanism by which it absorbs the radiation is just like with, with animals, it's melanin. Because when it's exposed to uh, extremely high amounts of radiation, um, as we know, yeah, as anybody who's ever had a, a black vehicle knows, it, it's way hotter than any other colored car uh, when it's sitting in the sun. And that's because dark colors attract heat, and they, they hold on to that heat a lot more, uh, a lot more readily. Um, the same principle applies with um, radiotrophic fungi. So it's able to, to use, to produce, the fungus itself produces melanin, and that collects all of this radiation and it's then able to metabolize the gamma ray as in, the, in not the same way that photosynthesis occurs but in kind of the same way where it just absorbs the energy and then it can convert that energy to metabolic energy it's really cool we don't we don't fully understand how it's uh, how the mechanism by which it does it we know that it does it uh, just like photosynthesis we don't know how photosynthesis works we just know that it works so that's pretty cool. As far as, and this is getting into uh, electronic waste as well, there's a study where there's an 80% recovery of gold from electronic printing circuit boards, which is absolutely astounding. Because the only other way to recover metals from electronic waste is by burning them. Which, obviously, that's not something you want to do, right? What's the chemical? Uh, fire, also. Oh, oh, chemicals to, yeah, to, yeah. to break it all down yeah. and then yeah, that, does that get 80 to 80 percent? The chemical means? I'm not sure if well, it does or doesn't. Um, that's, I'm just curious. Do, do you know if it, if it gets? Well, you're able to extract the gold from, from those components from through a chemical process. I just They're didn't know if you knew if it was 80 percent or not. No, I don't. I just know that. Super cool. It is very dangerous. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> very volatile compounds. Yes. And you still have to do something yeah. with those those compounds. Yes. Um, you still have to it's not worth people it. People have to administer yeah. them. It's not worth it. Associated with them, and that's not mm -hmm. good. Yeah. Um, and that's why most places, when you recycle your electronics, uh, it just goes to a third world country where they burn it in open pits. And again, it's tended to by people with, at most, they have a piece of cloth over their face. Mm -hmm. And if they're really smart, they pee on the cloth because mm -hmm. ammonia will negate a yeah. lot of uh, poisonous compounds. Um, but, you know. Breathing in your own urine for however you need, like two dollars a day or however much. Like it's, it's again, that's a different conference. So um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, but with it, yeah. Go ahead. Is this the green body the gold ends up? Yeah, okay. yeah. Just like with the other metals, uh, the gold nanoparticles will accumulate in the fruit body, and then you can take it and you can melt down the fruit body and do whatever uh, chemical process is necessary to mm -hmm. recover those uh, gold nanoparticles. Um, it's not just gold as well. Um, can do uh, many other, it can micro-remediate many other heavy metals. Uh, the other great thing that fungi will do, it won't always remediate that. It depends on the species and it'll also depend on the environment because sometimes you'll get a fungus that actually works with, and this can happen with saprophytic too, just spontaneously. Usually it happens with uh, rhizophytic fungi or endophytic fungi, where it's living in the rhizome. It's living with the, uh, the root structure of the plant it'll interact with the plants to make it more resistant to toxins rather than clean it up. 
So this could be a number of things like increasing the rate at which it absorbs certain nutrients, um, even the, the size of the plant. So it's a larger biomass and it's not as affected by the same concentration of toxins in the soil. So that's something that's pretty cool as well. But as I said, there's currently no viable solution for electronic waste. Most of it is burned in these big pits and they literally burn the electronics and then they pick up the, the copper wires afterwards and that's copper recycling in a nutshell. Uh, and over here, copper recycling is only different. The only difference is that there are carbon, there are scrubbers to collect all the carbon that gets burned off. Uh, but this needs to stay, this needs to stop. This includes uh, e-waste, this includes solar panels as well. Everybody's going crazy over solar panels. Well, solar panels are made with lead and cadmium and mercury and a lot of other really bad stuff because that makes that increase the efficiency. And they only last for about 25 to 30 years. And after they're done, we have no idea what to do with them. There's no plan to dispose of them anywhere. There's not even a pit in the desert somewhere where we can bury them. There's just, oh, nobody knows what to do with solar panels. Uh, yeah, no need to do with solar panels. Only the glass and metal can be recycled. So when solar panels get, uh, get sent off to a recycling plant, only the glass and the metal can be recycled. So all of the heavier elements, the, the lead and all of the other things that, that make it especially bad, those end up in either the atmosphere or the groundwater. Either, either of those methods are terrible. And so with that in mind, even though like we know that if you leave it there long enough, the, the 80%, that was just, they, they had a couple of months to study it. And you know, these kind of studies are rather expensive. So that's why there was the 80%. If you just let it go, it would eventually remediate all toxins, all, all parts of the metal, over the course of maybe a year or two or three, which is, that's not nothing, but that's, couple of years and you're done. You don't even have to worry about it. Which is why another point with the uh, with compostables that we're going to get into a little bit later. Um, the Biodegradable Plastics Institute is solely run by big oil companies. And they absolutely hate this kind of technology because there's no home composting standard. There's only an industrial composting standard. And industrial compost is a incineration recycler that's burning at about 300 degrees Fahrenheit, about 90% humidity for about 60 days. And in those conditions, yeah, pretty much everything will decompose. So to say something is compostable, it means absolutely nothing. It just means that it can go into a furnace and it'll melt. Well, whoop de doo right? Um, <coughs> excuse me, would you, oh, what you saying? Yeah, no, that's good. Um, also very handy in this. Before we move on to pesticides and dyes, anybody have any questions about metals? Uh, so what is a heavy metal versus a regular metal? Well, um, so that would be like Slayer, Lamb of God. <laughs> <laughs> um, heavier metals are metals that um, organisms don't really have a use for. So like for example, iron. Iron is a, is a, is a Vital, vital mineral. Um, it's very important for us for to produce oxygen and to supply our bodies with oxygen. Uh, we, we need iron. Uh, copper, there's some conjecture on both sides. Uh, one side says that copper is really useful. The other side says that eh, it doesn't really do anything. It's not that harmful. You can eat it if you want. Uh, there's no real, uh, in reasonable amounts, right? Don't go eating pennies. But if, <laughs> if you know, your food has copper in it, there's not really a, a, a lethal or a dangerous amount as long as it's not copper colored. Um, the, the heavier, there's a, there are a few other metals. Um, and again, we're talking a periodic table metals. Not, Higher atomic numbers. Yes, yeah. exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and there are, there are a few others that um, bodies can, can produce and we can work with and metabolize. Um, the heavier metals, and specifically toxic heavy metals, uh, would be like your mercury, your lead, your bromium. Your, yeah, yeah, bromium. Um, all of the different, yeah, you, even chrome. Um, no, chrome is an alloy. Anyway, uh, all of the different um, elements that that are 
too heavy for us to really do anything with. Um, would be a, a heavy metal. When you say too heavy for us to do anything with, are you talking about us as ingesting them and or yeah. using them like selenium and copper? And yeah, like if it gets into your food, your, your body can't, it's not like okay. a nutrient. So if it's not those, it's heavy? Yeah, okay. yeah, okay. yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's not something that we can use. <coughs> <coughs> What was that? And then bio, they bioaccumulate mostly. Like In, yeah, they bioaccumulate up the food chain, which is also why you're not supposed to eat uh, certain fish if you're pregnant. Like you can have, you can have like tilapia, but you can't have like swordfish, for example. And that's why all the eagles are dying because they have too much lead from bullets in whatever their carcass. Yeah. So. Yeah. Who's uh, pushing on a bullet? <laughs> not chewing on bullets. Uh, yeah. Not scavengers, like people they, like the eagles they'll, are scavengers. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, most. Yeah, so like they'll shoot a uh, it's like like bird hunters, for example, they'll shoot a bird, the bird will fall down, and but they didn't bring a dog, or they can't find it, or whatever, and it just sits there and has you know a shotgun shell in it, and the eagle comes along and eats it. And it's like, huh, this is a weird looking seed. <laughs> That, that's a whole other thing about steel versus lead in ammunition. Again, for a different, <laughs> a different con conference. You just have major problems. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Probably more. Well, you know, just if everybody listened to me, we'd be in a lot better place. <laughs> 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 I'm going to try to micro-remediate a solar panel. What? Micro-remediate a solar panel? What was that? Right. Yeah. Have people tried it? Have you tried it? Have I tried? No, because I don't have a solar panel that I want to uh, I have I have some like Christmas decorations that I'm going to start experimenting with, um, but I haven't I haven't tried it specifically with a solar panel. Uh, my right now I'm concentrating on plastic because I see that as a, as a much more immediate threat. Um, there are a lot of different uh, I, I wouldn't use microspora to remediate uh, metal. There are a couple of different fungi that would be better for that. Um, like we were saying uh, with the mold based, uh, those tend to attack metals a bit more voraciously. Um, but then there are also, and that would be for a, uh, just to, to remove them from the, the substrate. Um, and then there are also more food bodies that could take that. Um, but getting rid of metals, that would be a, a little bit of a different strategy than what I'm doing with the, uh, the plastic. Uh, good question, though. Uh, so pesticides, dyes, and really anything that isn't a metal-type polymer chain or isn't an organic-type um, of waste, um, just like basically other, right? So this would be like pesticides, this would be um, all of like leather tanning and textile washing, like all of the dyes that are used to make clothing, um, all of the like the stain-free, like wrinkle-free fabric type of additives. Um, when those are used, usually they're just dumped into the ocean, right? And you can look at satellite photos of these clothing factories and see that the water actually turning colors because of the different dyes and chemicals that we're using. Uh, so this is obviously something that's very, very important. Um, another thing that's very important for this is pharmaceuticals, because our current water treatment plants, they don't filter out any pharmaceuticals at all. So everybody who's taking uh, you know, Xanax, everybody who's taking SSRIs for their antidepressants, everybody who's taking any kind of medicine at all that doesn't get fully metabolized by their body they pee it out, and then it goes into the, the treatment plant, and then that mixes with the drinking water that everybody's drinking. Um, just because that's, I mean, that's the ugly truth of living in a city is we have recycled water. It's, it's clean in that it's drinkable. It doesn't have any toxins in it. Toxins. It doesn't have pathogens in it, I should say. It doesn't have any pathogens. It's not going to make you sick. But it has quite a few chemicals in it that are not. And even more so if you're living on the outskirts of a city and you have a well, then we're talking about uh, these chemicals getting into the groundwater and getting into the well water. Um, so that can be kind of a danger as well. Um, no pun intended. In addition to all of these, uh, there are also many carcinogenic dyes that are used. Uh, so who has heard of the app Wish or Alibaba? They have been caught red-handed selling carcinogenic children's clothing. 
uh, the, the wrinkle-free, the stain-free fabric. Well, there was a reason that shirt was only a dollar. It's primarily about an uncle and his beer cat. It, it's, it's, it's the same thing. They were both owned by the CCP. <laughs> yeah. If, if, no, for real, like, if you operate a business in China, the CCP has to own 50%. Yeah. So, law. Um, so there's no such thing as a business over there that's not involved with the CCP. And I'm not laying this at the feet of the Chinese Communist Party because they might just not care. It might, you know, that, that's whose uh, malice is razor never attribute to malice what could be attributed to incompetence. Um, I don't personally believe that they're on a mission to poison the environment. I think they just don't care. There's no accountability. And especially in the public sector, there's very little accountability for anybody because it's just bureaucrats. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's all just capitalization, you know, like yeah. trying to get, get that market. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. It's, yeah. It's all about money. Then, well, it's, it's not even about that. It's about paperwork. Mm -hmm. So for, for the public sector, it's bureaucracy. You have bureaucrats who they don't want to do the paperwork, so they're just going to, fine, go do your thing. If it was completely privatized in the private sector, you have to... Private sector demands results, right? Like, you can't. There is a lot more regulation here than there is in yeah. China. <laughs> and, oh, and then there's Yeah, and it's not just Shanghai regulations, you know. Even so far as, like, for-profit universities, as, or private universities as opposed to public. Uh, you know, public university, you get tenure, and you can, you can do whatever you want. Uh, private university, you have tenure, and you get a bunch of complaints against you. Well, adios. Like, tenure is much less of a, of a tangible Thing. Um, so, so that kind of plays into it as well. Um, but I didn't, I didn't come here to bash China. I'm not, you know. <laughs> I just, I, yeah, I mean. <laughs> uh, but the, the big thing to understand is that uh, these carcinogenic dyes are still being used and they are alive and well in the world. And uh, fungi can absolutely take care of that for us. Um, they can metabolize it in a way that, at worst, all you have to do is just pick up the mushroom and throw it somewhere else, away from the, the ground and you know, wherever these dyes are being, being used uh, during disposal. Um, and backpacks as well. Um, we found a bunch of backpacks. This was on, I want to say it was, uh, I want to say it was Dateline that they ran a story about this a couple of years ago where they had investigated a bunch of, uh, a bunch of different uh, clothing and, and uh, children's things that they have got from from overseas, and they found a startling percentage of carcinogens. So we've all heard about atrazine, right? Who, who's heard about atrazine? Yeah, the old Alex Jones thing. Was, yeah, ha ha, Alex Jones. No, he was actually right about this. Um, atrazine does cause population collapse in frogs. What happens is, who sings Jurassic Park? Remember the plot? Uh, the, the dinosaurs change their genders because frogs can change genders in their natural environment. Yeah. 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 yeah, it actually does. It doesn't turn them gay, it turns them trans. Uh, no, I'm not even kidding. This is UC Berkeley. Uh, we've known yeah. this since like the mid-2000s. Uh, what happens is frogs, is, this is part of like an amphibian's uh, just like natural evolutionary process. They're able to detect the, the chemicals of the population around them. So that just like in Jurassic Park, if they exist in a population that's only one gender, a certain percentage of them are able to change their gender so that the species can continue to, to evolve and to go. Uh, which is like a you know, miracle of life. This is a beautiful, beautiful thing that's absolutely wonderful. Like, I'm not, like, this is incredible that frogs are able to do this and stabilize their own population. The problem is that atrazine sends frogs these signals that tells them that there are too many, there's too much testosterone in the environment, so you have to feminize. And so you have frogs that, uh, it's over 90% of frogs that get exposed to atrazine will, will feminize, they'll grow ovaries spontaneously. But they shouldn't be able to do that, but they do because they're amphibians, and amphibians are weird. But fortunately, there is a fungus called Trinity's maxima that will completely degrade atrazine 100% in a matter of months. Uh, the study by UC Berkeley um, found that the atrazine, the atrazine will accumulate in their endocrine system. And with this fungus, um, within, I think it was like three months, um, there was no atrazine present in both clay soil and uh, sandy soil. Which, if, if you're not a soil scientist, basically there are three types of soil. There's sand, there's clay, and in the middle there's loam. 
So sand lets water, to, you know, goes straight through it, doesn't absorb anything. Clay won't let water pass through it at all. You know, it's clay. It's very, very hard to absorb. And then in the middle you have loam, which is your, your, your soil that you want to farm with. Loam is good stuff. Um, and so if it'll, if it's fine with, with both of these two extremes, <laughs> then there's no reason to expect it to not be fine with the loam. Um, and so this is an absolutely incredible fungus that I very excited to, uh, to get to work with in another couple of years. You know, this 31 countries have banned atrazine. It's, it's well known that it does horrible, horrible things to the environment. Uh, and it just accumulates in the groundwater. Uh, but don't worry, Alex Jones, we can save, we can save it from us. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's always kind of like a controversial topic just because he's such a, a weird pariah. But yeah, he was right about the you know, broken clock right twice a day. Like whatever you want to say about him, he was right about this. So like, and this is a pretty cool thing that It's not the only fungus that will protect against atrazine. Uh, there was also a type of oyster that was used uh, with solid state fermentation uh, that took care of atrazine as well. Uh, and obviously, atrazine is not the only pesticide in use. Uh, so it's great that there are a variety of different fungus, fungi that can uh, metabolize. So this is a situation where the fungus is completely breaking it down to a harmless state, or it's like collecting the fruity bodies, and then you have to like collect them and it depends on the on the pesticide, on the okay. herbicide. Uh, some of them, the ones that contain the more heavy elements, uh, heavier elements get transported to the fruiting body. But if it's something that an organism can deal with, the the mushroom will deal with it. Metabolize it. Yeah, it metabolize it. Yeah. So mushrooms are the mushrooms are actually more closely related to us than they are plants. Um, we branched off plants, and our common ancestors branched off, and then one billion years ago. Uh, mushrooms and animals branched off. So whatever the mushroom can eat, the we it's probably not going to cause harm for us. Again, mushrooms are way better at handling toxins, so they'll survive for a part. But if they're able to take a compound in and digest it, then usually they'll be able to digest it into a compound that that we can eat and is suitable for humans and animals and, and uh, livestock and pets. And, So C. elegans is not not the uh, the realm that I'm a worm. That's it's a different species. Yeah. It's a fungus. Yeah. Um, there 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 are worms that eat pesticides as well. Um, I'm not super familiar with those. Um, but yeah, it's the taxonomy as a whole. It, it's it's very confusing. Like I get it. We got to name a bunch of stuff. Let's use Latin words. Cool. There's a lot of a lot of different <laughs> like there was like I was watching somebody um, talking about microspora. There's like five different types of fungi that are something microspora. Usually starts with a P. So I'll be reading about P microspora, thinking it's pestisteliopsis. I'm like, oh yeah, it's cool. It does this. Wait, it turns into what? And ah, uh, you know, anticlimactic. <laughs> But yeah, it's just I have this here just to just to demonstrate that there are, are a variety of different organisms. Even trichoderma. Everybody hates trichoderma, but it'll it can take care of stuff as well. It does have its uses. And then a mold. Do what? And then mold. Yeah, yeah, green mold. Yeah, if you've ever had green mold, uh, you try to grow mushroom and you grow uh, green mold instead. Mm -hmm. That's trichoderma. Um, it's very very common in the, the soil. Uh, it's very helpful for plants. It's very helpful for gardeners. Uh, usually when you buy a cocoa core, coir, um, that's not meant for like hermit crabs and animals, they'll usually treat it with trichoderma just because it's, they assume that you're gonna be using it for flowers and a garden bed, and it helps plants grow a little bit more quickly. But that also means that you're gonna have to pressure cook it in order to kill those spores, because a dry endospore is able to survive heat sterilization. So if you just pour boiling water on top, it's not really gonna, not really gonna kill all of the spores. Um, it's just gonna pasteurize. Pasteurization is usually good enough, but you're still, it, it's not, nothing is gonna be as good as sterilization. Um, I know I'm getting off, a little bit off topic here, but uh, there's not really any definitive proof that in, in a closed system, right, for indoor mushroom, Outdoor is a whole different, that's a whole different ballgame. 
But for indoor cultivation, there's no such thing as beneficial bacteria. The mushrooms will figure out their own bacteria. Um, they have various ways of um, dealing with that. With their own bacteria, basically they travel with it. Um, their spores are able to generate uh, additional uh, symbiotic uh, growth. It's in very, in very, very specific situations. Usually they don't even need it. If it's a saprophytic fungi, for example, which is most of the gourmets are saprophytic, it, you can, uh, it doesn't require any other organisms at all. Uh, but at best, there, there are plenty of bacteria and plenty of other organisms that won't compete with gourmet mushrooms when you're growing them indoors. And that's true, that's absolutely true. Uh, so you can have a lot of success with pasteurization just because not everything wants to outcompete the mushrooms that we want to grow. And very few things are pathogenic to us. So it's not, when I say there's no such thing as beneficial bacteria, that's not me saying like, oh, get rid of them. No, it's, it's either going to be bad or it's not going to do anything. It's not going to help, but usually it's not going to do anything, like one way or another. It's, it's not anything to, real big to worry about. Another thing is oysters. Uh, they're not particularly extremely effective. Um, well, I should rephrase that. They are extremely effective. They're not okay. always the best. They're very rarely the best to use, but they're a great this sort of like all around, like general purpose um, remediative fungi, like remediative solution. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and they're tasty too. Um, but if you're gonna, if, if you were wanting to start your own uh, experimentation with microremediation, something other than plastic, because that's great for plastic. Uh, but oysters will also dissolve plastic. Oysters, excuse me, they'll also, as we saw a few slides ago, they'll do pesticides. Oysters will remediate metals from the environment. Uh, there's a lot of different things that oysters will do. It's a, it's a great place to start. Uh, so if you're just wanting to just throw some spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks, I would recommend starting with oysters. Um, who here has grown oysters? Yeah, all right. Yeah. Some of the easiest to grow, huh? They'll eat anything. Uh, I know they'll eat, they'll chew through a uh, plastic bag in less than a year. Uh, like a mushroom growing bag, if you just leave it out, uh, it'll continue to eat through it. And after a couple of months, it'll get kind of like the consistency of jelly. And you'll be able to like grip it and tear at it a lot more easily. It's pretty cool. Yeah. I usually just throw away, like rip open the, the bag that it comes with and just throw it away. Can I just leave that bag in there with the yeah. straw? Yeah, always. Yeah, it'll yeah it'll take it a minute to eat, but but yeah, um, if it's now if it's an imported bag, it might have some uh, some toxic metals like we were talking about earlier. Um, but uh, every so Unicorn is the only company in America that's producing plastic, and like you can go to the factory in Plano, and like you can see like they literally they have plastic resin, and that's it. If you get the biodegradable, they have like a 2% solution that they add to make it degrade. And that's it, so it's just straight plastic. There's no other binding agents or anything like that to, uh, to cut down on cost. Does um, the biodegradable bags speed up the oyster eating process? Hmm? Oh yes, it does. Um, so the, uh, the additive, how, how the biodegradables work is it coats, the additive coats the polymer structure with a chemical that will catalyze with exposure to oxygen and ultraviolet radiation. So after a predetermined stall period of, if it didn't have to be autoclaved, it would be like eight to 12 months, but because autoclave is so hard on just everything, and heat breaks down everything. Um, so with autoclaving, it's, you really got like three months to play with it. And then after that time, it'll start to catalyze. And with that exposure, the, the additive will break up and because the additive is bonded to the molecular structure, it will break up that structure as well. And at that point, it will break up to a small enough piece that the Dalton member, which is just a way of measuring atomic mass, is lower than the atomic mass of water. Uh, bacteria digest everything through osmosis, so they just kind of kind of lean up against something. And if it's light enough to go through their pores, the way they do it is water. So bacterial pores are this uh, evolved to absorb water, and then anything that can float, any any bits of carbon, any other nutrients, anything at all that's lighter than water, uh, will also be absorbed by the bacteria. And so, because these carbon structures, once it, the polymer breaks down, it's lighter than water. 
but that will then be absorbed by the bacteria, and the bacteria will poop it out, and you'll have a nice little fertilizer. And then you'll also have organisms that will come in and eat those bacteria. And you can establish an entire food web, an entire ecosystem um, of that. And I didn't include any of these on this slide because I didn't expect to get this far into biodegradables. But I do have some pretty cool pictures of um, some biodegradable bags that were exposed to UV for like four months, and you can see them change color. There's actually a microbial colony that's developing on the surface of the plastic itself. Because as this, as this polymer breaks up, bacteria are able to, to actually stick to it and colonize the surface. And when bacteria colonize it, well, it's like, think of like a, like a game trail, right? All, all the predators of bacteria are attracted to that because it knows that this is where the action is, right? So at that point, it becomes, like I was saying, it becomes an ecosystem. And eventually, you'll have bugs and all kinds of stuff growing out of it, uh, which is pretty cool. So just to break down real quick, um, plastic companies have played a very dirty trick. Um, remember what I was saying before about compostable and how it's basically just a buzzword and everything is compostable? Because there's no such thing as a home composter. Uh, that's just, yeah, it's just marketing plain definitions. Like they could win in court, but obviously they wouldn't win the logic of talking to an everyday person. So oxodegradable simply means that it breaks down with exposure to oxygen. Everything in the world breaks down with exposure to oxygen, you and me included. Right? Oxygen is one of the most volatile compounds in the entire universe. That's why fire goes with oxygen, right? So ox if something, in order for something to be biodegradable, that means that it has to break down to a certain point where it can actually be metabolized by organisms. So when you see something that says it's oxodegradable, that's just plastic. That means absolutely nothing. It's complete non sequitur. Oxo, this you know, this metal is oxodegradable. You know. Oxo they just try to confuse you with the big terminology. Yeah, <laughs> and it works. And it works because the uh, Scandinavian countries, which own all of the paper manufacturing in Europe, uh, well, who has the big, who has the most mo money to gain from a plastic ban? Paper manufacturers like. We want to talk about how, how bad plastics are for the environment. Okay, let's talk about how bad paper mills are for the environment, mm -hmm. right? So you have, uh, there's a thing in Europe where the EU, the Science and Chemical Advisory Board for the EU, requested additional time to review oxo-biodegradables uh, because they said that, well, you, your oxo-degradable composters take only two months to dissolve things. That's pretty cool. But this says that it'll biodegrade in the environment, and it, it wouldn't be economically viable to have something that, you know, this is more than two months old, I guarantee you. And so we need something that will last quite a bit longer before it degrades on its own, right? Like we were saying before, you can't just have, you know, you can't just throw it in the garage and let it dissolve, like, while you're waiting to use it. The uh, paper manufacturing companies successfully lobbied the Scandinavian governments to put pressure on the EU to say no Oxo biodegradable should only take two months because that's how long it takes for a composter to break stuff down. And so now there's an oxo biodegradable ban, and there's a huge outcry because it's like, why would you, like, it's a step back. It's a step back in the opposite direction. But it's the Phoebus cartel. They were, the Phoebus cartel was originated in Geneva, Switzerland. And uh, their legacy continues to this day because it, it's just a part of this whole uh, single use philosophy that uh, all, all these corporations are adopting. Uh, yeah, I kind of already, already talked about that. <laughs> but, and it's, uh, I finished it up. <laughs> all right, hey. Well, as I said, thank you. Should have, and yeah, that's my right. fault. Yeah, Everybody, this is Garrett Wilkerson. He heads up the marketing and public relations for Unicorn Grow Bags, which is one of the nation's uh, largest suppliers of autoclave bags. Uh, the only, the only supplier the only, oh, in the USA. I didn't know that. Yeah. The only. So yeah. buy American, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> made right down the street in Plano, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. right off of like 75 and uh, Plano Parkway. 
Uh, and if you guys were there at the Texas Mycology Conference earlier uh, in May, uh, or April, I'm sorry, yeah. April, April, sorry, April, months yeah. mixed up. Uh, Garrett was the reason behind that whole conference, so let's give him a round of applause for that. Because he approached me and wanted us to participate, and of course, that's right where you know this organization. That's our our whole purpose is to educate people about mycology and try to advance it in the North Texas region, right? So um, with that being said, our next weekend foray is planned for Halloween weekend. We're gonna be hosting a psilocybe presentation and microscopy workshop in Denton. Uh, and it's gonna be a, a costume contest for a $100 winner. Uh, and it's gonna be Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Halloween weekend this year. So Alan Rockefeller is coming from California who is one of the foremost experts on psilocybe in North America and uh, he's gonna be bringing everything with him including his $15,000 microscope. So we can have like, uh, a pretty cool uh, experience for everybody to enjoy. Uh, and you know, one more time I just wanna thank Derek for coming out here. And spending his time with us and educating us about plastic and microremediation. And um, if you have anything else to mention, Garrett, you know, the floor is yours. Can uh, we visit your company in Plano? Uh, call ahead because oh. there's, yeah, there, there's tours are kind of. So kinda the different. company's Unicorn Yeah, bags. Unicorn Bags. Um, you, can, you can pick up bags, uh, they'll do pickup. Um, but as far as tours go, I don't think that they're doing it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, you can call ahead to pick up, or is there an office? Yeah, call ahead, yeah, call ahead <laughs> okay. to pick up. Um, would would you do it for us sorry. as an organization, though? It would be a good thing. Yeah, yeah uh, I think, I, I think that would be great for, uh, yeah. I think if yeah. the management yeah. would like to yeah. have a bunch of people yeah. come to her, yeah. 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 you know, uh, uh, whatever, uh, is, the organization is here to educate people, you know, so of course we'd be all over <laughs> visiting uh, any facility, whether it's cultivation or uh, otherwise, right? Like our other sponsor, Texas Fungus, is in Arlington, and they have a, a small mushroom farm, right? And their facility is not large enough to have a big group like us come there, but they still do tours, you know, if you, know, you go by there, pick up some mushrooms, they'll gladly give you a tour. You know, and he yeah. probably will even explain some of the uh, logistics yeah, behind fine. cultivation, right? Because uh, if any of you are interested in that, also Texas Fungus is hiring, so if yeah. anybody wants a job, yeah, they're hiring. Have two positions there if you really want to get into mycology. Uh, and last thing before I kind of wrap up here, we're gonna go outside in the back right here for about 30 minutes and look around for fun. Oh, dive. can we make a couple announcements about um, iNaturalist? Oh yeah, yeah, thank you so much oh, for yeah. reminding me. iNaturalist, uh, look up uh, North Texas Mycological Association and if you become a member, um, let us know. I'll put you in there. As, you have to be a user for all your um, mushrooms to come up, but the good news is you don't have to download anything, it's automatic. So if you take a picture of a mushroom outside on the iNaturally, it automatically goes there rather than having to download. Yeah, if you go to our website, uh, on the homepage, it says join our iNaturalist project. So all you have to do is click that button and it'll kind of get you to that link to where you need to go. Yeah. Uh, and once you join the project, we're still figuring out the uh, actual settings on the projects to where we can kind of just accept people without having to manually add them into the group. I think we're stuck manually, <laughs> but it's not a big deal. One. But just bear with us, you know, it'll take us maybe a day or two to add you into the group. It's just, we started it maybe earlier uh, last February, month or yeah. something like that, and we've already got like 3,500 observations in the North Texas area. And we're recording all of the biodiversity that we see and that's really why our organization exists, because we want to know what's out there. Also, our next foray is going to be at Arbor Hills uh, Nature Preserve on the 15th, yes, Sunday 15th. If you haven't gotten your ticket yet, please go to our website. Yeah. And so, it's been uh, fixed, the uh, website. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, okay. So yeah. It should be on the events. Can I yeah. ask you a couple of questions before we of break course. up? Um, Please, are you done with, with announcements? Coach? Oh, yeah. another thing, I'm doing a Master Naturalist Presents for the Dallas Library. I'll, I'll put that in the newsletter. 
uh, a basic mycology class again. Yay. So it's for the public. Are you going to do that? Yeah. Yay. Yeah. It's on Zoom. <laughs> on Zoom. So. Awesome. But um, so I'll. And if you haven't signed up for the newsletter, I would sign up for the newsletter. Then you can find everything on our homepage, uh, the iNaturalist Project, yeah. uh, to sign up on the newsletter. Everything. We started a Discord channel if you guys want to join our chat room and talk about mushrooms. You know, so all these you can find on our homepage just by going to our website. Awesome. Okay. Oh. Just two quick things. Anything else? Oh, no, one, one more thing. I'm yeah. sorry. It's, <laughs> sorry. No, it's fine. It's always one more thing with me. Yeah, uh, <laughs> We've got microtubes, right? So if you haven't heard of this, this is our newest um, addition for Perk as a member of the organization. Our microtubes are filled with species that have been cultivated to pass out to you guys. Right? So we have 21 different species, including Garrett has donated Pestilopteopsis microspora to us. And what we do is we're going to go out every month at our forays and we're going to hand them out to members of the organization. You can pick from one, we'll probably take like five species to each foray and alternate in between because it's just too much to do like on demand, you know. <laughs> so what you get whenever you come there is what you receive, right? So if you're a member, you get a microtube, uh, one species a month, call it a surprise package. You know, you get to take it home learn how to play with it and cultivate it, right? Um, one microtube is enough to split into several of these uh, agar dishes, plates, or you can sterilize some grain, right? Drop it in the grain, make sure it's fully colonized, and then you take that fully colonized jar, break it up, and then put it into a bunch of different already sterilized jars, right? So you're kind of multiplying off of that one of the microtube, or bags. And the other thing is you can you can actually buy pre-sterilized agar dishes as well. So if you don't want to mix with making your own, you know, or if you want to play with different nutrients and things like that, um, there are several vendors online that are very reputable that do these things. Uh, Mike Tyson is one. Uh, it's spelled the same way, but it's, uh, no, actually, uh, Mike, you mean NYC, the Mike Tyson, NYC, Mike Tyson, NYC, Mike Tyson, NYC, yeah, he did uh, the Microdose Festival yeah. um, yeah. in awesome. Miami, Microdose Wonder uh -huh. last year, uh, oh, he okay. headlined. Um, I'm not sure if he's involved with them uh, as far as like executive goes, uh, but he, he was their headliner. Mm -hmm. And as far as, I use Tim the Cat, um, he does a lot of different, uh, different like specialty type stuff um, for that. But really, if you want to, so another another handy thing, most mushroom people they have some kind of pun in their name. So if you want to to figure out if if you're looking at somebody online and you want to see if there's a scam or not, look at their followers, like how many people are following them, and then scroll down to the ends and see how many like Mike Jones, Mike Mike Tyson, Mike Jordan, uh, Mike OJ Fox is one. <laughs> Mike OJ Fox. So many like mushroom like puns that people. Then, but if you scroll down to the ends and it's like, you know, Michael Roberts 457, uh, you know, Melinda Jones 230, you know, you know, like where it's just like credibility regular names, and like you know, it's very easy to sniff out uh, scammers if you're using that method. And unfortunately, in the mycological world, there seems to be a lot of scammers trying to cash in. Mm -hmm. So if you get a weird request from somebody, especially on Facebook. You know, trying to talk to you about selling you something, right? Obviously, ignore it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if it's not somebody you know. Don't click on random like, links. Uh, this has been happening a lot, too. Yeah. Uh, some of my friends have got their accounts hacked, um, you know, so even a friend of yours might send you a link, and if you click on it, their account is hacked, and now yours is hacked. So just be careful. Um, if you have anything else yeah, to add. Um, don't use tel uh, no, no, it's not telegram. Uh, don't Magic use WeChat. Group? I'm sorry? Yeah, well, Messenger, yes, Facebook. Um, but WeChat is also Facebook and has been compromised as well. Which chat? We chat. Oh, we chat. Yeah, like yeah, we, we all chat. chat. We chat. Okay, we chat. Um, okay, it okay. A, yeah, it was a chat program. It was, I forget who, I forget if it was made in China or if it was. I think that real was big in China. China. Was that I, that was I know it's huge in China. Um, but I don't know if it was developed there or if no. that was Facebook's thing and then they imported it to China. And then China and Facebook didn't. See eye to eye. On I think it was like WhatsApp. Yeah. 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 WhatsApp. Yeah. WhatsApp is what I'm thinking of. Not WeChat. WhatsApp. Okay. Yeah. WeChat is, WeChat is also not that great. Uh, WhatsApp is also. Uh,